Well, it's been a little while since the last film or video, and uh, there might be a little bit of a reason for that. Uh, well, after I made those stack molds for the, uh, the lead hammer molds, not all of them came out. I needed to make one more, okay? But I was also running out of time because by the time I got that done, I had a week uh, to go before my granddaughter was going to be, uh, their, you know, their volleyball team was getting to start up. Now, they, uh, they play at the, you know, all over the place, but uh, at their school, at the, uh, goodness sakes, well, at her high school, they had this tiny little bench that they used uh, to try to keep score on try to use the score keeping uh, electronics on, you know, and all that. And uh, wasn't this year, but it was the near the end of the last season that my daughter said, hey, you know what? All those other schools have this nice big rollabout uh, table that they use. And we got this tiny little thing here and you like to make stuff. Why don't you make them one of those? And I said, well, I probably could uh, let me look you know at, at one of the other ones and we'll take measurements and see how it goes well I scoped it out didn't look too difficult now I'm not a cabinet maker and I'm not a furniture maker but I'm just you know I, 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 I'm a woodworker as a hobby okay never never kind of a, a professional at all I wouldn't pay me to buy to uh, make anything uh, because I I just don't have the talent to be paid for it but I have just enough talent to be able to uh, make stuff and make stuff that'll last a little while okay so I scoped out all the the dimensions that you know we were likely to need and it just happened that I had a table at my house that used to be Navy property that I was able to uh, acquire and no acquire doesn't mean steal acquire means that I took it off the trash heap uh, over on the Mayport Naval Station they were tearing down buildings one and two and any of the old uh, furniture that nobody else wanted they were putting it in the, the dumpsters okay well this hadn't, hadn't made it into the dumpster yet I asked the the uh, person in charge if I if I could take it he said yeah go ahead and take it out of here so it, what it was was a about a you know it was just basically uh, a horizontal platform with four legs and it was uh, had formica on top of it and you know it was just a a, a usual just a, a table that they they use the Navy used or the uh, administrator the personnel or the any of those guys that had it in that building they just used it to stack stuff on as a little storage utility uh, table it was uh like i said about two foot tall about two foot deep and about seven foot long which was pretty close to uh what the dimensions were <clears throat> excuse me of the um the other tables that were you know quite a bit more uh fancy than our table was uh rather the table of the uh that they were using over at the high school that my granddaughter goes to all right, well, I had just finished making four out of five pairs of uh, mold halves that I was going to send up to Keith Fenner, which you may have already, if you watch Keith Fenner's stuff, you may, have, you may have already seen that I finally got the fifth one done and I sent them up. And uh, <clears throat> started working on that. Okay, and I'll go ahead and uh, post two pictures of the, of the finished, the finished, uh, project for the table there you and it came out okay you know I I wouldn't I wouldn't have stuck my nose up at it and, and told them to take it away because it's a piece of junk it's and it might even last for quite a while because I put a lot of put a lot of long screws and and wood and I mean you could probably dance on it and nobody's gonna nobody's gonna break it but uh, it took probably three weeks to get that done and 
after that was done and delivered uh, I still had one more of those molds to make for Keith Fenner's uh, event the um, what's in your toolbox event and you know when all when uh, all said and done I finally got that done packed up all those uh, molds and sent them up to Keith Fenner well now in between the time I got the last mold completed and painted and packed up we had this little unnecessary storm came our way you might know might have heard about it it's in Hurricane Irma came our way and uh, did a little damage around Jacksonville well I shouldn't say a little it did only a little damage where I live okay I I'm fortunate that in 91, 90, 91, uh, they were just building this uh, neighborhood. And so the requirements for hurricane preparedness were in place. And they brand new buildings were being built with this new requirements for uh, hurricane, you know, not to get knocked down by a hurricane, in other words. And so far, out of the uh, two or three uh, hurricanes that has hit us since then uh, no building damage knock wood and just the uh, stuff on the outside of the building the trees and stuff were tore up well the same happened with hurricane irma when it came through our area we have a tree out in front and a sycamore it's a sycamore and it's got really nice you know limbs when it comes to uh shade you know giving us shade I'm sure you've seen it in the in the background of some of my other videos. Problem is, it's not the strongest. You know, the, the limbs seem like every other day there's another limb falling off of it uh, that, you know, about the size of my finger because the limbs died out and snapped from the wind pushing it. Well, Hurricane Irma come through, came through, and uh, a whole lot of those limbs got tore off, okay? So, I think uh, the next day, the wife and I went around, started picking up all of those limbs and uh, branches and stuff that got tore off, put them by the side of the street like uh, the city wants us to, and they're gone now. But it took probably a good three weeks to a month uh, for that stuff to get picked up. Now. The pile I had on the side on, on the side of the road was probably all of three foot tall and maybe five foot long. Okay, it wasn't huge, but you should have seen it around here, around town. Everywhere was was debris. So I, I wasn't going to be complaining about it uh, not being picked up right away because there had to have been enough debris on the side of the roads to fill the uh the stadium downtown you know that's how much stuff was was tore up by irma and not to mention those poor folks that were near the river where they got all flooded out uh it just seems at uh, the oldest part of town they didn't plan ahead uh, to stay out of the flood plains and uh you know they got they got flooded in addition you know, even the ones that were out of the floodplains, that, that water was backed up real bad, okay? So, the folks, I mean, it seemed like it was just basically in one area, but it was, it was a bad storm, really bad storm. I didn't get any sleep at all that night. I was waiting for uh, the tree to be pushed the wrong way and hit the house. That's what I was worried about. Anyway, so those are some of the things that happened to keep uh, me from doing any more molding and, and ramming up and uh, to show you different ways of doing things. Now, now to today's subject, okay? <coughs> Pardon me. In the past, I've, I've made uh, some declarations of what, what good things can come from taking the effort and putting out the effort of uh, buying the equipment you need, uh, buying the uh, supplies that you need to be able to pour molten metal, okay? Uh, one of the subjects, or rather one of the examples was if you were, 
let's say like myself, who always seems to just wander up and down the uh, aisleways in the home department of uh, various stores, uh, and look around in the kitchen area, not because my last name's Kitchen, but it just happens to be a coincidence, uh, and see if there's any new gimmicks or doodads that might make it easier for me to uh, keep the kitchen clean. A little something that I took on uh, when I retired so that the wife wouldn't have uh, nearly as much, you know, duties to perform, as you might say. Oh boy, did I just see somebody's eyes roll. Duties to perform. What a sexist. No, no. Uh, you know, even if I was one of those, I'm still uh, helping her by keeping the kitchen clean. You know, she still has her functions in life. I have my functions in life. And uh, she'll tell you the first, she'll be the first one to tell you that I'm the least sexist guy uh, that was ever married to her. <laughs> yeah, she'd probably say it. Anyway, so I, uh, the last time I, sp I even brought the subject up on wh what you should do to make stuff, you know, you could take plastic things that are made by companies who want to, you know, cut corners and not make them out of, out of uh, metal to make them last longer. They, may, you know, make them out of plastic because they're a lot less cost and a lot easier to make lots of them. You find something you want to make you know, that, that you want to use, like in the kitchen, and, uh, but you don't want it to last only about a year's worth. You want it to last for, you know, a long time. Make it out of metal, okay? All right, and so I covered that. I made something uh, out of metal that they made out of plastic, that the company that made it made out of plastic, and uh, it's worked real well. Now, here's another thing that you can do. Another reason to think about, you know, doing what I did, acquiring the equipment, acquiring the supplies to be able to pour molten metal. And I'll tell you why. Now, when I was in the Navy, the only ships I was on was on tenders, okay? Uh, basically, to make it a, a short summary of what they do is they repair stuff, all right? We not only take care of our own ship, which we had to because we were, you know, ship's company, you keep your own ship repaired. But our job was to have uh, ships and subs come alongside and whatever was broken for them, whatever shop it had to go into, uh, it went to that shop. They either ordered the parts required or they manufactured the parts required. Uh, they repaired the problem, whatever the problem was, and then they gave it back to the ship and they put it back into uh, operation so that they were able to uh, perform their ma their uh, missions in the Navy, like patrolling for drugs, uh, being out over in, overseas someplace, and, and you know, you gotta have everything straight, uh, really, really well uh, performing when you're likely to be uh, hit by missiles or uh, fast attack uh, little boats, you know, so, that was our job, basically, on the ships I was on, is to repair stuff, okay? And uh, sometimes we had, you know, we couldn't, uh, they, the people who had a problem couldn't order it anymore. The ship or the device or the equipment, whatever the occasion was, might have been made by a company that no longer existed, okay? Uh, one, and the one example I can think of right away is on the uh, Sierra, uh, AD-18, AD being a destroyer tender, number 18, out of uh, what used to be, out of Charleston, South Carolina, had a ballast pump that was made out of aluminum bronze, okay? Now, this ballast pump uh, had numerous, numerous parts of it. It had the outer casing, which is basically two tubes and a cross across a chamber that when one one of the pistons come up it drew from the uh, the ballast I'm um, not ballast but the uh, where the wastewater and oil came uh, settled in the bottom of the engine or engineering spaces and then when it came back down it it shot you know into a holding tank or over the side depending on 
what was being uh, picked up by the pump. Well, that pump was made for a ship whose keel was laid in 1940-41, thereabouts. Okay, uh, all of my ships were old. The USS Fulton, my very first ship, AS-11, its keel was laid in 1939. Okay, submarine tenders whose keel was laid in 1939. The next three ships I was on, the uh, USS Piedmont, AD-17, USS Sierra, AD-18, and USS um, Yosemite, AD-19, their keels were laid uh, 1940 to 1941 thereabouts okay might have been 40 to 42 but in that time frame is their keels uh, were laid and the ships were manufactured or were made okay so you're gonna have a whole lot of equipment that doesn't need to be replaced very often at all but the problem is so the equipment that is set up for a particular system uh, you know, if the company that made it is out of commission, no longer makes them. Uh, usually, we, you know, up in the foundry, we would make it. After the geniuses up in, and I say that respectfully, the geniuses up in the pattern shop could make that pattern, we would take the pattern and maybe even a core box, depending on how big the pattern was, and we would make the casting give it to the machine shop where the, where the machinist repairmen are, machinist repairmen are, and uh, they would machine all the, all the surfaces that needed to be machined, put it back into operation, boom, we're back in, we're back in operation down in the engine room, whatever was not, you know, not working. In that case, in that case, it could be, you know, lots of stuff around the ship gets broken, uh, like the watertight doors. They got on them, they got those things that move on them. Those are called dogs. When you shut the door and you, and you secure the entire watertight uh, seal all around you, it's called dogging the doors. So you're shutting the dogs down. Well, there's some people over there think that you're supposed to hit those with heavy things to make it tighten more, and they wind up just breaking them. We would have to make a bunch of those dogs. Well, and because it was faster, number one, number two, I don't know if they even was able to find a uh, source for those. So the things like that, rare things or old, old equipment, old systems where you couldn't readily buy it, they would come to us, we would cast it, okay? We saved a lot of the Navy a lot of money and we saved them a lot of time. In addition, we got the experience of making those things up in the foundry. The pattern shop got the experience of making the pattern for that item. And the machine shop got the experience uh, to put that item into operation after all the machined surfaces and the holes and bosses and things like that were uh, done by them. And, uh, you know, everybody got a, a bunch of experience and we saved the Navy, Navy a lot of money. Okay, well, you can do the same thing out here in the civilian world, right? Uh, especially if you're a person who likes to uh, refurbish things, to replace things that are really old. Keith Rucker is a fellow up in Tifton, T-I-F-T-O-N, Georgia, is a, a, one of those guys. He's, uh, I think he said he's a scientist, a chemist, maybe, but one of his big things is that he really enjoys woodworking and he really enjoys metalworking. Uh, and by that, uh, mostly on lathes and uh, mills, shapers, you know, stuff like that. If you're a machinist, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Well, he also says he has a very bad problem. He says that he can't stop buying old machines. I mean, if you had to have a problem, I guess, I mean, I would choose that over drug addiction or being drinking or womanizing, I suppose. And uh, what he does is he finds these machines that look like they may as well go into the trash pile as, as old and de decrepit as they look. And, uh, you know, he refurbishes them. He puts them back into operation. And, you know, 
seems like the larger the better because if you get a nice large worm and uh, a metal make a uh, metal working machine hey you can work on larger things right um you go to home i mean uh go to uh goodness sakes the name of the place is escaping me right now harbor freight there you go finally the brain kicked in harbor freight has these small machines okay small hobbyist lathes small hobbyist milling machines and a whole bunch of other stuff most of which come from uh, china and are not held in high regard when it comes to uh you know, quality in some of the things okay uh in other words they break down too fast faster than you would ever want them to given the amount of money that you spend I wouldn't worry about that part too much, okay? I'm 64, right? Uh, in my youth, I remember everybody uh, complaining about the stuff made in Japan, made in Japan, that stuff a bunch of junk, okay? Well, Japan got better at making the stuff. Made in Taiwan, oh, Taiwan, what a bunch of crap they make. Taiwan got better. Uh, a little bit later, it's made in Mexico. Uh, and and you know there's other smaller and uh, pre um, not pre-industrial but uh, com countries that are becoming industrial when they start out okay they're not going to be using the best stuff and they're they're not going to be uh, doing uh, you know having the best technicians over working in those countries you know everybody needs to learn they're behind the learning curve okay in the case of China They've got a billion people that they can put to work, uh, and but they got to learn, you know, how to do it first. They also got um, they want to make as much money as they can as fast as they can, like any other company would. So they're not they're going to cut corners. They're going to use the the worst, not worst. They're going to use not the best materials. Okay, uh, they're you know they're just things are going to fail um, that you don't think should fail okay right now the only thing I would really buy and really rely on when it comes to Harbor Freight is a hammer okay nice big sledge I mean how can you screw that up right all right so but I have faith that in time they're gonna I mean the Chinese are gonna get just as good as the as the Mexicans did, they get a, like the Mexicans got just as good as the Taiwanese did, and they're gonna get just as, like the Taiwanese got just as good as the China, I mean the Japanese, okay? Nowadays, hey, we'll buy Japanese stuff, if, you know, who cares? Now it's just everybody, buy America, buy America, yeah. Well, if you're the guy who's only making $30,000 a year or less, but you still want to be able to work on stuff, you're going to not spend $40,000 on, on a hammer. Okay, You're going to find what you can buy, and you're going to do the best with that. You guys who said, buy America, buy America, uh, well, we're going to be able to buy America a lot more now that, that uh, we have some leadership that wants to force the companies back into America. Keep in mind, though, with all the... Uh, the work that they're going to have to do to get everybody back up to speed on making stuff it's not going to be as good as we think it's going to it should be right away all right everybody will learn i mean not all the old folks who used to work in those factories have passed on uh they'll be able to pass on their their particular talents and capabilities to the younger folks and then we'll be back up to speed okay well now that I've wandered off the subject three times or more, I went over uh, the 21st of October, or before that, uh, Keith Rucker put out a call uh, to have a little work day. You know, anybody who wanted to volunteer and come up to his his home and where his shop is, and uh, he's got he had a couple three. Uh, you know, brand, uh, not brand new machine, brand new to him, but they were older machines, probably built in the 50s and 60s, maybe one of them a little earlier than that. And uh, the deal was, 
that we were all going to get on there and chip off the old paint uh, so that he could paint it up and then like I would presume to take take things apart uh, the parts that didn't get chipped you know do that and then the machine surfaces he would you know work on those so they slide nice and easy again and put things back together and hey he's got a, uh, probably something he would have to spend twenty thirty thousand dollars on uh, now it'll work just as good as that and probably even better because you know they were might have been using considerably better uh, tech not technology but uh, craftsmanship in making those machines now I was up there uh, with a few other guys and uh, we get we helped him a lot you know moving stuff around that he wasn't going to be able to move by himself uh, and we did a lot of chipping something that I think he probably would have taken better than a week to do we got done in a day and uh, you know I, well, I was wore up let me tell you that I was wore up I did a lot of chipping and painting when I was in the Navy all the way from day one to shoot the end when I was a uh, chipping and painting as a chief because we don't have a lot of people in the foundry I think on average we had maybe five people in the foundry including supervision so you didn't you didn't just throw all that stuff on the two or three lower ranked men in the shop and let the second and third uh, second and and first and chief uh, just lays about you know if we were ever going to get anything done everybody had to get in on it and so I got, got on in on it also and I was pretty pretty proud of our shop you know uh, so when we were over there at Keith Rucker's, we got a lot of stuff done, but one of the deals I made with Keith also said, Hey, you know, I wanted to show the people who watch my videos how to do lots of other different things. Okay. Uh, and this, I was, what I was going to do uh, because he showed us on one of his videos, how he got this saw, the horizontal saw. It's, it wasn't a band saw. It was just a like a big blade about so tall and a, mm, so thick and about that long and it had a, uh, a vice on it a machinist vice that you know at the end over on the end of it uh, there's a there's a, a screw and then you have a handle that brings this up tight you know and then you can cut it off right well somehow or another that that handle uh, fell and broke apart okay little wonder because it was cast iron it wasn't nodular iron it wasn't malleable iron you know any of the other ones that are uh, you can bang on with a hammer and they won't break apart right away these were obviously cast iron because where they were broken is where it would be broken if it was weak metal okay now what my what I was going to do before I went up to that working party as we called it in the Navy is I was going to use a pattern that I made on my 3D printer, okay, and uh, I was going to I was going to use it to cast a handle to put you know that he could work with, uh, and uh, make a new one for his saw, and at the same time show you folks how to how to you know work and make one of these, okay. There's, there's more than a few people out there who may have broke their own hand their own hand wheel or a person that not only does uh, machinist work but does has their own foundry and yet one of the handles on their lathe let's say one of the hand wheels I mean on the lathe let's say uh, somehow got hit or or it got broken in transit to their house you know they need a new hand wheel I was going to show everybody how to make a hand wheel you know there's a million ways to do that but how a person in a small not so equipped uh, foundry could make one of those well it turns out that Keith hadn't yet uh, tried to braise up his cast iron hand wheel which is what he said he was going to do during the video he had other things happen that uh, took his time but he still had all the parts okay well here I said hey you know 
one of the things we did in the Navy a great many of the time is that some guy from down in engineering or up in deck department or somewhere around, they would have something uh, that had broken. They still had all the pieces. Hey, uh, can you make me one? And as long as most of the pieces were there, yeah, we usually did. And the same is going to happen with Keith Rucker's uh, little hand wheel. I have it right here. Here's what it looks like whole, okay? Now, when I got it from Keith, okay, you're probably, I hope you're able to see, see the white stuff here, okay, this stuff. That's kind of the foam that's generated using Gorilla Glue, okay? That's pretty good stuff for most things. I've never used it on metal, but right now it's holding real well. Now these weren't so busted up that I couldn't put them back together, kind of like pieces in a jigsaw puzzle. For the most part, you know, everything came back into play, into place. And it, all, it already looks as if somebody tried to weld this in the past okay you have this right here where it looks like somebody was trying to trying to weld it and when they got to that section they had too much amperage going through and they blew away the metal that was right there okay you have on the same in the same spoke you have the metal here and it's nobody ground it down and uh, so you have a big lump. Now, when I put this and you know, start making this, what I'm going to have to do is, is I'm going to have to find out where the parting line is on everything. And it's, it's pretty simple. On this section right here, the parting line is going to be where the hump is. Okay. So you, I'm gonna, just going to take, let's see here, if I can find something good to mark with. Let's see. This is exactly what I'm going to be doing before I start ramming it up. I'll find where the hump is and I will go and follow it all the way around. Now, why am I going to do that? Oh, you'll find out when I start ramming it up because this is going to be a free casting right it's not going to be on a molding board rather it's going to be on a molding board but it's not going to be on on attached to a board like that right so what I'm gonna to have to do is I'm gonna to have to make I'm gonna to have to make its parting line with uh, a pile of sand being you know pushed under it to fill in where the parting line has to be okay in other words let's see if i can wish i had a piece of board here maybe there's a the piece of board i can get it right here Okay, try to visualize that this board, okay, I'll turn it over to be able to visualize it easier. This board is now over on the molding bench. I've set it down, I've set this on top of it, okay? Now, if I just put part, uh, parting powder on there and uh, riddled some sand over it and just tucked it all in, I mean, it would still work. But my work would then be, after I rammed it up and I had a, you know, a nice bunch of uh, solid sand around it, you'd have to turn it over, take this out of the way, and now what you're going to see is you're going to see sand all the way up to this point, and you're going to see sand all in here, and what I have to do, <coughs> excuse me, 
is to make a parting line and so that means I'll have to take a tool and cut the sand all the way down to the place where the parting line is right same is on for the inside here okay you can see on this casting where the parting line was for the original uh, mold on this portion of the handle okay because they didn't they really didn't uh, grind them off all that good so that would be an easy parting line to find but you still have to find the parting line on this side of the rib and on this side of the rib so that you can have a solid piece of sand filled up all the way to that parting line in here in here in here and in here and then when you start ramming up this section the sand will come down to the parting line that you just formed and you when you take this portion off i mean this portion of the mold off you take this out and you have the mold cavity down here it'll look like this okay when you pour it once you cut off all the excess all right so that's the plan now before i do that though there's some things i'm going to have to do for instance this portion this is a tiny section that broke off right this was the only break right here this was the only break that was the well actually it looks like looks like this might have broken off the same as this broke off but somebody was talented enough to be able to weld this in place and that looks like the only place it was talented enough to to uh, weld in place because the rest of them were all messed up um, Keith said hey why don't you take this and make another one for me using this and I said hey much better because this is at least going to be big enough compared to this okay this is smaller than this see you can see it considerably smaller and uh, while this might have worked let's we, we should just give the original size casting now don't forget aluminum has a shrinkage rate and uh, once you you pour the molten metal inside the mold cavity when it solidifies overall dimensions will shrink a small amount all right so when this is gonna you know you'll see me doing it when this is inside the sand before i pull this out i'm going to tap this what we call it wrapping it like wrapping your knuckles against the door well this we're going to be wrapping this and making a little bit more of a gap in here than if we just pulled it straight out that's the method by which we tried to compensate for using the original versus the uh a pattern that a pattern maker would make patterns that pattern makers would make uh they make normally wooden patterns that have built-in shrinkage okay in other words if uh let's say if the the shrinkage for a particular metal is eighth of an inch per linear foot they would add that to this dimension okay making it slightly bigger and when this solidifies and shrinks it come down to the dimension that was needed okay well the only thing you can do with the original is wrap it real good up and down all the way around in all the dimensions and then you should have um, something that was very close if not right on the uh, the size uh, that you needed now one thing I'm going to do also is now this is a this was never machined this portion right here okay they have a set screw or uh, probably a tapered pin looks like that went through here <coughs> pardon me but they did machine this here and they did they did uh, machine the hole going through there so what I wanted to do is if I didn't get this quite big enough now remember it's going to be aluminum I'm not making stain I'm not I'm not making iron 
my little furnace well, I've never tried to make iron with my furnace yet you know maybe in the future we will and see how it goes but uh, this is going to be made out of aluminum now when you're tightening it and loosening it in the uh, you know while on the the shaft when you have a pin like this going through it when you do that you enlarge the hole drilled through the aluminum by a little bit you go this way you enlarge the hole by that and uh, you know eventually this is going to be worn out and you know he would have to do something about that in the future okay where the uh, the shaft and the pin come in contact with this hub it's going to get wore out okay this is even this is cast iron and well the hole right there is oblong okay right there uh, you may or may not be able to see it I'll try to get it a little closer might not be enough light but believe in me when I tell you even that hole in cast iron is oblong from the uh, from the hitting it and hitting it like that <coughs> so what I'm going to advise Keith to do is that once he gets the aluminum one he drills and reams and not reams drills and uh, well he makes enough room in here for him to uh, press fit a steel sleeve in there so that when he drills the holes that he'll have something that'll you know keep the pin from wiggling enough and uh, you know to that it'll destroy the aluminum up here okay it'll last for a while I'm pretty sure uh, maybe even more than the amount of time that he'll be uh, using it because don't forget he got that from a factory that was likely to be using it 24 hours a day so that's what the plan is going to be so the uh, I don't know this is uh, let me can't even read my greed out but this is this would be a good introduction to the next project I have still got to cut out all this excess junk on the side here from the Gorilla Glue cross my fingers that the Gorilla Glue doesn't loosen up any uh, there's bumps of the weld metal here I gotta try and drill that down or grind that down uh, there's depressions in in these like right here there's a depression in here the way I'm going to uh, have to take care of that is when I ram this up I'm just gonna have to take a hand tool and just widen that that gap replace that and uh, take the sand that's in that spot and scrape it away so that the metal will no flow no naturally into that mold cavity right so there's going to be a little bit of work left to do to this before I can ram it up I'm not going to you know have that on camera because it's I mean there ain't nobody out there that's not gonna know what grinding is all about but once I get ready to start ramming it up then I'll bring you guys back and uh, once I get the sand ready and get everything and get this ready uh, we'll have the next you know rendition or the next part of this project okay so until I get this all ready have a good day and Liberty Call